Normandy. The intel says only two out of five of us are going to make it off this beach. Freedom! Let us launch. They're gonna die without us. the first unit to go in. 110 men of C Company, 1st Canadian Parachute Battalion. In training, we thought we were the best, way tougher than the infantry. But this is going to be our first time in combat, our first chance to do our part. June 1944. The world's been at war for almost five years. Hitler's war machine has killed millions, and Europe is living under Nazi rule. But that's about to change. After two years of planning and training, this is it. D-Day. The plan is to launch a massive surprise attack against Hitler's fortress Europe. It's a do-or-die operation. We'd either set the stage for the defeat of Hitler, or get slaughtered and pushed back into the sea. The beaches are codenamed. Sword, Gold, Utah, Omaha. Us Canadians, we have one of the most heavily defended beaches on the line. It's called Juno. This is my story. This is our story. What's wrong? I don't mind jumping. I just I just can't stand looking. Well, switch with me then. We were going to be dropped deep into Nazi-occupied France, nine hours before the rest of the invasion forces even hit the beaches. Jeez Louise, Artigan, what you got in there? A few extra mortars? You're gonna drop like a rock. We were the tip of the spear. Woo! Best seat in the house here! Almost 7,000 ships stretched out across the English Channel. About 160,000 men. D-Day. The largest seaborne invasion in history. Holy Jesus. And me, a kid from Sydney, Nova Scotia. Way out in front. We'd been stuck on this ship for three days, seasick, couldn't sleep, couldn't eat, but the men were holding up. Seventh platoon, my platoon, mostly prairie boys from Saskatchewan, hunters, trappers, Indians, a lot of farm boys. We looked out for one another. Some joined for adventure, some out of duty. Others were just plain hungry, and the army paid a dollar a day. We'd been chosen to lead the first wave of the beach assault. It was going to be our first time in combat. Who's in, women? Other? You in, you little woman? I got five bucks on Apple. All right. We were young. Louis Brunning was only 15 when he first joined. We called him Apple. Hey, guys. What's this? Oh, on your girl? What? Oh, you got a girlfriend? You got a girlfriend? Huh? Who is she? No one. What's her name? Oh, come on. Who is she? Who is she? Is she? Is she? Look. Come on. Look. It's from my mother. It's <laughs> <laughs> from my mother. It's from my mother. What's it say? Nothing. Oh, come on. What's it say? Let me see. Well, what's it say? Uh, it says, um, 
God keep him safe. Well, God let him roll sevens, huh? <laughs> Amen. Come on. Amen. Make me some money. Stop! Oh, yeah! Oh, <laughs> no, I get too bad. Hey, hey, warm up again, again. Let's go. What, something I said? I joined the army, not the goddamn navy. Me? I was in the army long before this war. Signed up in Montreal, Quebec, just 17 years old. I didn't want to be no hero, just stay out of the poorhouse. I'm what you call a P.S. Permanent soldier. My wife said it stood for permanently stupid. My ex-wife, tell the truth. Silverberg, what are you doing? Joining the United Church? Good Jewish boy like you? Look, it's my mother's orders. Turn the J to a U, just in case we get taken prisoner. No one's gonna take us prisoner. We're going all the way to Paris. I'll find you all a nice mademoiselle. You'll see. Where are you going? Probably the only dry place on this whole goddamn military vessel. Don't puke in the tank, McGinnis. Yeah, don't worry, Silver. I got nothing left. <laughs> Our tank is a top secret weapon designed just for D-Day. It can launch directly into the sea. They're called a duplex drive. You take a Sherman tank, add an inflatable canvas screen, waterproof the hull, connect propellers to the drive shaft. Hey, what a... You have a 32-ton floating tank. And when she drives out of the sea, a big surprise for the Germans. That's the way to travel. First class. Final chance! We were going in, disguised as a routine bombing run. That's why we were packed into these old bombers like sardines. The drop was behind enemy lines, 15 miles from the coast where the main invasion force would land. We'd be on our own for days, so we loaded ourselves down with extra grenades, mortar rounds, you name it. Out again! Open the bloody hatch! There was France, from 500 feet at 200 miles per hour. The red light was the warning. Two minutes till the green light. Two minutes before all of us, 110 men of C Company would jump straight into God knows what. Remember, we've got 15 seconds to play that flight, so move fast! Target, slide me a cigarette, would ya? Hit that ground and move! What? Now? Five minutes to make it to the rally point! Five I don't mean for now. Minutes. For later. You do not make it! You're on your own! There. The whole goddamn pack. Good luck. I tried not to think about being shot on the drop, or landing on a tree, or drowning in the flooded fields below. We knew we were heading towards the coast, but the exact location of our landing was kept secret. Most bets were on Calais. Some thought Holland, even Germany itself. We're going to Normandy. Did anyone win the bet? No, sir. Good. Let's hope the Jerrys are even more surprised. The Americans have Utah and Omaha. Brits, gold and sword. The Canadian beach, Juneau Beach, is here. And our sector, Nan Green, 
It's here. Our target? It's actually a little fishing village called Cresel sur Mer. Everything else? Just as we trained. MG 42s, 55s, 75s, and the 88. The heaviest position on the beach, and it is all ours. The Germans had four years to turn the coast of France into a concrete fortress. Hundreds of miles of bunkers, heavy guns, barbed wire, mines. According to Army intelligence, our beach, Juno Beach, was manned by 8,000 German soldiers from the 716th Division. It was one of the most heavily fortified sectors of Hitler's Atlantic Wall. Get past the first 15 minutes, boys. We're going to be OK. All right? Dismissed. Most of us weren't expected to make it off the beach. We all knew, but nobody talked about it. Smile, boys, that's the style. What's the use of worrying? It never was worthwhile. So pack all your troubles in your old dip bag and smile, smile, smile. <laughs> we had 15 seconds to empty the plane. If you hesitated, the men behind you would get scattered and we'd all be screwed. Of course, the plane had to be exactly in the right place at the right time. After I jump, I'm thinking, what the hell am I doing here? D-Day. We launch at dawn. The plan is to drop into the sea two miles offshore and arrive just before the infantry. There's no turning back now. Listen, gonna tell you straight up. I mean, tells us only two out of five of us are going to make it off this beach. If we want to make it, we're gonna have to keep our heads, stay smart. Remember that we got one job punch through the enemy lines. Remember that, and we'll be okay. The paratroopers would have landed by now. Each airborne unit had a specific objective. Knock out a bridge or a communication line to prevent the Germans from launching a counterattack against the beach. Our job was to secure the drop zone by launching a surprise attack on a German garrison near a town called Bearville. We had to take out their main gun before the next wave of 2,500 paratroopers came in. If we failed, those boys would get slaughtered. I had five minutes to get to the rally point. Problem was, I had no idea where the hell I was or how to get there.
First time I get bombed, and it's by our own Air Force. Maybe they missed their target. Maybe we'd been dropped in the wrong place. Maybe both. Maybe we were all screwing up. Stanley Cup. Habs. Four games straight. You look like shit, Hardigan. You're one to talk. Any idea where we are? France? How the hell did we get to the rally point? I don't know. We'd missed the rendezvous. I wondered. How many others were lost, wandering around the French countryside, or dead? Dawn, June 6th, 1944. At last we could see it, the long gray coastline of Normandy. Then our Navy guns opened up. So loud, it was like getting punched in the chest. We hoped it was doing a lot worse to the Germans. All right, all right, one last time. LCA drops us off here at H hour. Catesman. Chief snipes the machine gun position here, while me, Apple, Bashnik, and Colty take the Bangalores and blow the wire here. Good. Blow the wire. Chief. Section one pushes through to take the machine gun pillbox. Stork. We then rally here and attack the main bunker here, destroying the 88. Good. All right, there'll be a lot of heavy smoke. What do you do if you get lost? Grab Stark and poke his head through the clouds. <laughs> Move up that beach and keep moving no matter what. You do not stop to help the wounded. No one stops. Medics take care of that, all right? Listen, given the naval bombardment, Chances are nothing will be left. With seas like this, launching the tanks was going to be tricky. But the time was here to get him in the water. The bloody Brit won't let us launch. What? Navy command is saying it's too rough. But this is bullshit. Well, Sergeant, I can't see their point. We never launched in conditions like this before. But, sir, Four I... Four of your men can't even swim. Yeah, Including but... you. Major, I speak for my men. We'd rather take our chances out there than stay on this rolling puke bucket. Come on, sir, let us launch. Those infantry boys, they're gonna die without us. Okay, leave it to me. What about the Brit? It's not his show. Sergeant Guerriere. Bon chance. I was thinking, was that very brave or very stupid? Looks like we're gonna be in the movies. Yeah, like a regular Gary Cooper, huh? <laughs> Hi, Mom. 
Hey, Apple, you know why bagpipers are always walking around? Get away from that noise. Load him in. Section one! Loading! Well, bloody time. Let's move! Pick it up! Pick it up! Careful with that, kid. After three days at sea, we finally boarded the landing craft that would take us into the beach. Each carried a platoon of 36 men. Just little boats made of plywood and steel. Bouncing around like a cork. According to plan, we were to land on the beach at H hour, just when the naval bombardment was scheduled to stop. We were scared. Anyone who said he wasn't was either a liar or just plain crazy. Navy command said it was too dangerous to launch, but our CO decided to push forward. Everyone in our squadron, all 19 tank crews, felt we had to chance it. Radio check! Main gun in position! Ladies, our skirt is up. Take us in, make it in. Aye, aye, Captain. We launched more than two miles offshore, the first tank in our unit to go in. But I wondered how many of us would make the beach. Dawn, D-Day. The first infantry assault wave is already headed for the beach. Further inland, airborne units are racing to secure their objectives to prevent a German counterattack against our beach forces. Malin and I had spent the whole night dodging enemy patrols. By sunrise, we finally made our way to the objective, the German garrison at Veraville. We were so late, we figured the rest of our unit had already knocked out the gun that threatened our main drop zone. Kayla, take the brain gun over there. Keep your head down. Why haven't you taken the objective? Because of that pillbox. The German artillery's back there, hidden behind that wall. Right there? Yeah. Where's McLeod? Major McLeod's dead. In the house there. He was scouting when the gun opened up. Jesus. Where the hell's everyone else? Only 17 of us made it. We can't get past that pillbox. So go around. We tried that. There's minefields on either side. There's no way in. We have to do something. We can't take it. We're outnumbered. And we got nothing. No piads. One Bren gun. Your mortar's the biggest thing we've got. Best bet is just to keep them tied up till reinforcements come. Bullshit. We've got to do something. Let me scout the position. Maybe I can find a way in. Okay. See if you can get up to the rooftop. Sergeant McPhee and the others had kept the enemy engaged all night. But sooner or later, German reinforcements were bound to show up. Careful in there, Hardigan. The Germans had converted this house into a barracks. While I was lost in the French countryside, our commander, Major McLeod, led the assault. He stormed the place with just a few men. 
The ground floor was deserted. McLeod took a handful of men up to the second floor. It was empty too. The beds were still warm. The Germans had fled just a few minutes earlier. McLeod must have had them convinced they were outnumbered. began to scout for the Germans' main gun. But the gun found them first. Oiko, get the beer. Yes, sir. Down. Get down. Get down! I'd never seen anyone dead before. I didn't know things like that could happen to a person's body. Last night, they were alive. If I hadn't got lost, it could have just as easily been me lying on the floor instead of my friends. If I got higher up, maybe I could see our objective, the gun that killed those men. see the pillbox that had us pinned. And there, beyond it, the main gun. A 75 millimeter artillery piece surrounded by minefields. Past that wall, the Germans were using a path that led from the pillbox through the minefield, straight to the gun. If we could get to that path, we could get to the gun. But how to get past the pillbox? was a mess. Less than half the tanks that were supposed to launch made it into the water. We were supposed to hit the beach just before the infantry, but the heavy seas delayed us. McGinnis, turn right! Turn right! Sarge, I can't turn against the waves. The waves are too big. Go! Go full throttle! We're full out! heavy wave over that canvas skirt and down we would go, trapped inside a steel coffin. I was worried for my crew, but we were late. Without our heavy guns, those infantry guys wouldn't have a chance.
When our Navy guns fell silent, I knew we were in trouble. Every minute we were delayed allowed the Germans time to regroup. Why have our guns stopped? We're late. We're supposed to be on the beach now. A mile offshore, the sea was crowded with landing crafts. But as we drew closer to our landing sectors, we began to spread out. 100 yards! Get yourself ready! Sebastian, you okay with that? Soon, we were alone. I'm right behind you, buddy. Churchtown. It's still there. Looks like everything's still there. You missed our beach. 50 yards! Open the gate! Steady! Keep it steady! Section 1, stand by! I want those Bangalores to the wire fast! Don't stop till you're there! You see a Bangalore drop, pick it up! You see a ladder drop, you pick it up! Good luck, sir. You'll be fine, Apple. Stick with me, kid. Go in full speed! bombardment had left the enemy's positions unscathed. Where the hell is everyone? We couldn't see them. Where the hell are the tanks? But we knew they were waiting for us. Regina Jones! Oh, oh, Section one! Go, go, go! go, They told us if we could survive the first 15 minutes, we'd take the beach. But we landed directly in front of a machine gun pillbox. Five minutes in, and I'd lost most of my platoon. We stay here, we're dead! Cover me! Cover fire!
fire, but we were still trapped. There were no tanks, no support. We were alone. a.m. D-Day. Only 15 minutes in and half my men are down. The enemy resistance is fierce. I made it to the beach, but so many of my men never made it out of the water. On the beach, there's nowhere to hide from the mortars the mines, and the machine gun fire. We were trapped behind the wire until a lone tank surfaced from the sea. McGinnis, stop! Dropping the skirt. We were the first tank in our unit to reach the beach. This is three, three the rest had either sunk or were scattered. We were only minutes late, but the beach was already littered with bodies. McGinnis, keep us moving. Go full speed, straight ahead! Hit the pillbox, load one round, HE! of the machine gun pillbox there was a large fortified bunker it was a tank killer no match for the bunker but we could hit the machine gun that was killing our infantry i gotta get close out the pillbox but the main bunker was still hunting us we had to get off that beach with the pillbox destroyed i made my way to the bunker to take out that artillery piece
the beach to escape the German gun and blasted our way through anyone who tried to stop us. the bunker and found myself underground. The Germans had built a secret network of tunnels to move men and supplies. close, but I didn't know where or how many. The beach invasion is underway, and thousands of paratroopers have already dropped into occupied France. Thousands more are headed our way. To protect the drop zone, we have to take out that main gun. I found a way in. Where? There's a small gap between the wire and the north wall. You can only see it from the roof. Yeah, okay, I am listening. Why don't you send Malin to the roof? He can tell the boys to fire while you and I crawl up. <coughs> you bloody nuts. Even if we get past that pillbox, how are we going to take out the 75? We have to get close. Fire flat, like a bazooka. <laughs> it's only a matter of time till German reinforcements show up. I only have five rounds, so we have to get close. We hit him point blank. It'll work. Let's do it. Ross, you fire my own signal. Let's go. As the battle raged overhead, I could hear the enemy. We had taken the command post. Above ground, everything had gone quiet. I figured either my men had taken the beach, or they were dead. McPhee and I made our way to the stone wall. This would be our only chance to take out the main gun. From the roof, Malin would give the signal for our guys to open up.
along the path through the minefield toward their gun. We needed to get the mortar close enough to fire it point blank. We couldn't afford to miss. We gotta get in front. Embrace it on the tree. Ready? Ready. Go. Garrison at Vereville had us outnumbered, but we took out their gun and captured more than 80 prisoners. We radioed the code word blood. It meant C Company, the first Canadian parachute battalion, had completed the mission. tank made it off the beach and into town. The fighting was street to street, house to house, dirty fighting. The place was crawling with snipers. We hated snipers. You caught one, you didn't take prisoners. We made it through town supporting the infantry then headed to our next objective. We stopped in the French countryside. You could hear the war in the distance, but here, Everything was calm. Three, this is three, three, alpha, over. Three, this is three, three, alpha, over. For a few minutes, the war seemed a long way away. Nice, eh? Sarge, the CO wants us to rendezvous at a crossroads a mile up road. One other thing. Our troop, number three troop, we're the only ones left. Let's settle up. Out of all the tanks in our squadron, we were the only troop left. On our way to the rendezvous, we learned that snipers had killed a number of our comrades, friends of mine from the same unit. Nels could radio it in. Let the infantry deal with I it. Let's take us in! That is a goddamn order! Maybe I wasn't rational. Maybe I was angry. So we went in. Fire. Sir. 
Fire! Sir, what the hell are you waiting Fire. for? People, civilians. I'll do it myself. Serge, we gotta go. Leo. The sniper. She was just 19 years old. Her German fiance had been killed that morning. I had done my best to protect my men, to make our objective, and to come through in one piece. But victory, it comes at a price. What happened, Serge? Did you get him? Hey, what happened? Driver, let's go. had broken through the first line of German defense on Juno Beach. Hitler's Atlantic Wall was finally breached. For many of the German prisoners we had captured, their war was over. But for many of my men, they had lost so much more. Catesman! Catesman. They killed Apple! Ah! Easy. Easy, brother. <laughs> Lieutenant Grayson here, he, he took this bunker by himself. You should have seen him. I, Serge and I were just along for the ride. You should have seen it. All by himself. By mid-morning, the Regina rifles, with support from the tanks of the 1st Hussars, became the first Allied unit to secure a beachhead on D-Day. Many of the men, many of my friends, paid for this victory with their lives. Of the 110 men of A Company, only 17 of us made it off Juno Beach.
sir. Lieutenant Grayson. What now? Get the men. Let's go. Yes, sir. This footage of Canadian troops storming Juneau was amongst the first images of D-Day seen around the world. On that day, our troops pushed further into France than any other Allied army. The Battle of Normandy had just begun, but within a year, Hitler would be defeated. Of the 16,000 Canadians who landed on D-Day, almost 1,000 men were killed or wounded. up with my talk so she tells me in the morning that oh yeah I dream a lot and I talked to a fellow this morning down there same thing it never leaves us I can close my eyes and, and just see pictures I've tried to forget and it's been over 60 years so a few things fade away, but then something happens or, or questions are asked that uh, relive the situation. Some terrible things way back in there that we just don't talk about. I don't know, it's just a feeling I have that I was supposed to be there, and I was. Well, I'm glad I was there, but I don't want to go back. Where do I start, you know? I gotta start thinking back. You, you come up with that saying. It's hard to remember which, what you tried to forget. <laughs> took part in the biggest armada that ever sailed the sea. Oh, you would almost walk to France, jump from one piece of equipment to another. I was a section leader, and I was in B Company, and it was with, I had 12 platoon, and that's 12 men. You were just like a, their father pretty well. It was quite a responsibility. 
You know, it was a big adventure for us to leave home and be out on our own, really, in a sense. So it, it was exciting for us. It was sort of, we felt it was a duty to do. That was, uh, and there's so many men out of work. They had nothing, and what else could you do if the government isn't going to do anything for you? Join up. I picked my first opportunity to go and join. I had a brother who was killed in Italy. I was mad. Swore I'd get me a, kill me a German. We're all there for the same reason. We had to be. In this thing together, and the quicker we get out of it, the better, you know? Yeah? It was really quiet. There was nothing said. It's just one of those things. You knew you, you had this job to do, and you just kept it to yourself. Well, I think a lot of thinking and a lot of praying. <laughs> Oh, well, we had to sleep some, but we... You didn't sleep that much with that on your mind, knowing that what might happen, what could happen. The night before, we got instructions to write our last letter home. I was married, young, just, just, just married, very young and married. And who do you send the letter to, your mom and dad or your wife? I addressed it to all of them. That's a hell of a letter to have to write. That channel, I don't know whether you know it, but it can be rough at the best of times. But it was very rough, horrible rough. Everybody, including myself, was seasick like hell. The big uh, ships, the destroyers and the uh, battle ships opened up a tremendous crescendo that that's why I'm wearing two hearing aids now. We had to crawl down, I don't know, maybe it's 20 or 30 feet on these scramble nets. And you had to be very careful because the water it was so rough that when the waves come, it'll lift the landing craft away up and, and then let it down, and you had to make sure that you didn't get squashed between the landing craft and the ship. Right behind me, the battleship Rodney sat. And every time the gun was fired, the recoil, eh? And every time he came forward, he sent a 20-foot wave and that little barge I was on just went just 20 feet up or 20 feet down. I'll never forget it. And I think maybe that's why I was so damn sick. I didn't give a damn if I made it to France or not. We had bottles of rum, and it was passed along both sides. And uh, everybody took a swig, you know. And when that one went empty, another one came on. We were, I don't want to use this word, but we were more than half fist when they hit the beaches. There was lots of uh, fellas that had trained for two years and never touched the beach. They were dead before they ever touched the beach. I watched one that they hit a mine, and I just happened to be looking that way, and all of a sudden, everything just big, big explosion. They just went blank, black and two, you could see two bodies going up in the air. There was the uh, tanks. I don't know if you ever saw them. They, were, they floated them in. They had curtain on them, and, and they floated in so far. Amazing. Floating with a 45-ton tank with a couple of three or four aprils and a couple of struts, and you know, not a good move. The whole thing got hit with a big wave or something. Down it would go. Next one, done the same thing. Too much heavy water. Way too rough. Wiped out right there. 25 men, five tanks. Off of that tank carrier that we were on, there was five didn't make it, and our tank did. 
You're scared stiff, and you can't tell it to anybody. Everybody feels like you do, you know. It's a, it's a hell of a situation, really. Yeah. You're scared stiff, and you just wonder, if, is, is this it? That moment is, is when you realize then, you realize then it was for real. I've always said you either grew up that day or you didn't grow up at all. You were trained that just as soon as that door opened, you jumped out into the water and you headed for the beach just as quick as you could get there. In case they had their guns aimed at you, well, they could just kill all you before as you were coming out. The first fellow, he got up and he got hit and he fell off into the water. And the second guy, he. He got hit in the arm, and he laid on the gangplank there. And then it was my turn. I was the third guy out. Well, he had to holler at me a couple of times, because I, I was petrified. I couldn't move, you know? When you get up to your chest pretty well, and you get the big wave, and you, it pushes you forward, and then when it backs, it pulls you back again, it, it was really hard to I had to get onto the beach. I waited past a couple of bodies already floating. I hit the ground running. I could see the sand kicking up where the bullets were hitting them. And I just kept running like hell. I was too stupid to be scared. If you get hit, well, then that's the time to start screaming. These guys were peppering us. They had the concrete pill boxes all along. They had their smizer, MT-42, fast, a fast, fast belt-fed gun. Just a like that. They were fast. At the time when you get hit, it's more of a shock. It doesn't hurt, but I couldn't stand up. I couldn't run. I couldn't walk. I, the only way I could maneuver was crawl or wait till the tide pushed me up a little, because the tide was coming in all the time. <laughs> I, was, I was scared. <laughs> I'm telling you, I was really, really scared. But. You had to go forward. I bet, bet there's eight or 10 people laying there face down in the water. Regenerate rifle boys, shot right on the beach. Yeah. And you can't stop and pick those guys up. It wasn't pretty. Never forget it. Yeah. I reached the uh, seawall. I could see everything unfolding like a giant landscape in front of me. Uh, I could see guys running around, guys screaming, guys crying. One man was waving a Bible and screaming for his mother. I seen like the, this tank, what they call flail tank, big chains in front of it, turning and they're blowing up the mines as they go up the beach. So I followed him up the beach, went off. When we got tracks on France, 
who just drove maybe a couple of tank lengths out of the water. And all of a sudden, I hear this thing, like a sniper's shot from, and we looked around, and we saw this church steeple. That's where he's at. The order was, I uh, still hear it, gunner, traverse left, steady on, church steeple. You're on, got it. Fire when ready. We took care of him, and uh, from then it would go forward. Our section would have to clean out this one pillbox. That was our particular job. We didn't want to be together because of a shell hit. We'd, we'd all get killed, so we had to kind of space ourselves out. You just kept going till you hit that first line. We threw in a hand grenade first, and just as soon as that exploded, you rushed in the back door, and then the thing, you just sprayed it, sprayed anything that moved with bullets. And, uh, and uh, that was it. Anyone that had, was, had a gun and, and waved it around, there was no hope for him. It's either you or him. Sergeant Snyder said the first guy he shot, he had given up. And, he kept hollering, comrade, comrade. And he said, I shot him anyway. He said, there was still a lot of fight left in, left in him. He said. <laughs> you know, it's a hard thing to say, but they said that there was no way we could take prisoners because there was no place to put them. If there were a German come out, it didn't matter. You disposed of them. That was just it, because you had to clean everything out of the way so the next wave of soldiers could come through. And uh, that's uh, the way it was. And how we ever got off there without losing a man, well. Und leider sind da viele auch ums Leben gekommen, ja. Da habe ich bald in den Hosen gemacht, wie man sagt, ja. Und da habe ich gebetet an Gott, was ich früher eigentlich nie tat. Da habe ich gebetet, ich weiß nicht, das rette mich, rette mich. Und ich habe bei meinen Eltern gedacht. Some Germans, they were medics. And I said, first you're going to do my men. And he says, nein, he wouldn't do it. I says, and you're going to do me first. And I told him in German, ich bin a Jude, you know, I'm a Jew. And you're going to do what I tell you, or else. And I, there was a native guy standing beside me, and I said, lift your rifle, aim at his head. When you hear the word nein coming from him, don't wait for me, just shoot the son. Don't wait for any orders. And boy, he was just ready to go, you know. He, and this guy started to shake. He was, you know, they were scared of natives. He, he said, okay, okay, you know, he all of a sudden he spoke English. <laughs> you don't even think about it. The thing is, you've been trained so long that destroy your enemy any way you can. And you had no emotions at all, really. But it's after, I find it harder now. <sighs> to think he was a human being just like I was. The only thing, he was doing the same thing I was trained to do. Protect his country or protect what he was supposed to protect. Naja, die Kanadier waren sehr korrekt gegen uns über, wirklich, ja. Die haben uns die Kekse gegeben, ja, die Biskotte gegeben und Zigaretten. Ja, das war, da haben wir gestaunt. Als Gefangener, ja, ja. It was a while before, finally, the shooting stopped, and that's when my work started. My job as pay clerk was to record the the dead 
every day. The pay had to stop the minute a man was dead. Government wasn't going to pay out an extra nickel if they had to. There were 63 bodies uh, lined up on one side, and the burial party was removed the lower half of their dark tags. They put them in a box and brought them over to me. My job was to enter the name of the person. I knew most of them. Some of the men I knew very well. When I finished my job, I went back to the seawall. I sat down, and I started to cry. I never... I never cried so much in all my life. Finally, the paymaster came over and said, it's time for us to move on. And that was time for D-Day. You know, sometimes you, you wonder, well, what the heck am I doing here, you know? I don't have to be here, you know, going through this. And then you, you liberate a village, and, and these people come out from I don't know where. They come out, and then you know why you're there. I go out like that, and I'm a big man. With his mitraillette, he doesn't have a bush. I say, no, he doesn't have a bush. He was French, you speak French. But we are Canadians and French, with the accent. We are French. So after that, I'm going to Calvados. 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 Et le lendemain, avec un libérateur, c'était la joie. C'était la joie. Ah oh là. Ah oui. Read the history books, and the Americans won the war. Oh, sure, they, they put a lot into it, all right. But the Canadians are the ones that took the... They brought a lot of the... Uh, uh, attacks, and the Canadians were always put in that position that because they were so good at it, they were given that job. Maybe it's just the way the Canadians are. When they get a job, they just go ahead and do it. They say, well, we, we got to do it, let's do it. I thought we were just a bunch of farmers. <laughs> the those farmers turned out to be good fighting men. In fact, we were the first regiment to reach our objective. You know, when it's all over and you come home, uh, <laughs> you, you sit up in bed some night and you, you'll, you'll live a little bit more of it too. Your wife kind of gets tired of this, you jumping out of bed and walking around the room and come back into bed, you know. I, I don't know. Uh, I'm glad I was there. I'm glad I witnessed it. I'd have felt terrible if I, if I hadn't taken part and did something, you know. Everybody pulled together. It was only Joe and Sam and Pete and Harvey. I feel sorry for the little guy. And uh, there was lots of them in the army. That's all they had, you know. Yeah. We stand for two minutes. What do they stand for? 65 years. Their whole life. We, we came back. We've enjoyed life. We had a home, we had a wife, children. They didn't. They didn't have any of that. But how often do we think about it? How often do we think about our freedom, really? You know, how often do you think about your freedom?
Next night, a young farmer sets out to find himself in the trenches of the Somme. Catherine Cookson's epic Great War saga of love and loss, The Cinder Path, here on Yesterday.